this lecture, we're going to discuss the formalism behind what we did in the last lecture. We're going to introduce a certain kind of proof system, or what's called a proof calculus, named natural deduction. Natural deduction is a common mathematical notation that people will use for specifying rules about inductive data structures. In particular, we're going to use natural deduction to specify the rules of semantics for programming language. In the next few slides and the rest of this lecture, I'm going to discuss precisely with you how natural deduction works, and I'm also going to give some examples particularized to the if or if semantics we talked about in the last class. Now, natural deduction is a very old system that dates back to the beginning of the 20th century when people were trying to figure out the roots of mathematical philosophy. They were trying to understand the roots of what is called proof theory, how they can formalize constructively what it means to structurally interpret mathematics via characterizing how you can think about proofs computationally. Now, there's a really rich and interesting theory here that I would be happy to talk to you about offline. However, unless you're really willing to dive into it, it can be pretty depthy to get into. And so in this lecture, I'm going to just focus on a particular slice of natural deduction. I'm going to give an example of how we use natural deduction to specify programming language semantics. And then when you see uses of natural deduction in other places, for example, when we see it using typed lambda calculi, we'll be able to recognize the rules. They have a very similar and routine structure. Plus, mathematical uh, natural deduction is something that you'll see very commonly written out over literature and other fields potentially as well, and it can just be a common technique to learn about. Now, to specify the semantics of a programming language using natural deduction, what we're going to do is we're going to give a set of what is called inference rules. These inference rules look like this. They've got a uh, top, that's an antecedent, the thing above the, uh, the, thing above the line. Those, those are the assumptions. They've also got a uh, consequent, so the thing below the line, the thing that must be true if the thing above the line is also true. So the rules read sort of top to bottom, where you sort of say, if the thing on the top is true, then the thing on the bottom must also be true. The rules are sort of schematic in some ways. They offer a sort of a schema for building or constructing intuitions for things. So, for example, the following rule says that if C is an integer, so if C is some object that lies within the set Q, which is the set of integers, then C evaluates to C or evaluates to itself. Now, I want you to be careful. I'm introducing this notation right here. When I say something on the left, down arrow, something on the right, what I'm doing is I'm saying this thing on the left evaluates to this thing on the right. Again, you can read this notation, E down arrow V, as E evaluates to V. So this rule right here is actually defining a mathematical truth. We're going to have a collection of these rules that specify the semantics of our programming language taken together. If these rules apply, they're going to tell us how programs execute. This first rule is the constant rule. It's going to say any number C that is an integer always evaluates immediately to itself. And this is a counterpart to this sort of metacircular interpreter we wrote in the last lecture. This is just a specific formalism. Other kinds of rules are going to have multiple antecedents. So you read these rules by saying if the th first thing is true and the second thing is true and everything else above the turnstile is true. So if everything on the top of the turnstile is all true, then the thing on the bottom is true. So it's kind of like an and. Everything on the top has to hold. And then if that's the case, you're allowed to deduce that the thing on the bottom is going to hold. It's just sort of a rule system. So for example, you can look at this rule here. This rule says, if E0 evaluates to N0, and if E1 evaluates to N1, and if using algebra, N prime equals N0 plus N1, if all of those things are true, then this rule plus says that plus of E0 and E1 evaluates to N prime. All right, and to step back out here a little bit again, just remember 
These are rules that we are defining. When we're building a programming language, these rules don't come to us from on high and aren't justified. It's our job to come up with these rules. All right, we're using natural deduction as a way to help us sort of build these rules and convey our intuition to other people using them. There are a whole bunch of different ways you can specify what a programming language means. One is just to write an interpreter for it, for example, in Racket. Another way is to use these natural deduction style rules. Using natural deduction, though, has a lot of really uh, interesting consequences for reasons we're going to talk about in a few more slides that make it an appealing alternative to just writing an interpreter because these rules are often very tight compared to, for example, maybe having to read a whole bunch of racket code that you might have to read. These rules can just um, be understood by anyone who understands the natural deduction sort of system and can then interpret your language without having to understand whatever the implementation language you used to build it was. All right, and we've got another rule here for div. This rule says if E0 evaluates to N0, and if E1 evaluates to N1, and if N prime is equal to N0 divided by N1, then the entire thing of div E0, E1, evaluates to N prime. And remember, again, if I haven't said it enough, we are defining these rules. Natural deduction is just this framework where you can write things above the line and you can write things below the line. We're introducing a lot of new notation here. So please make a note of the points that you don't quite understand and we can discuss examples in class. One of the things that I think is particularly confusing is just learning to read this down arrow notation. Remember to yourself, this is saying, if we can deduce, and we'll talk about how you come up with these things above the line, if you can deduce that E0 evaluates to N0, which will require more and more and more proofs as we'll see, and if you can deduce that E1 evaluates to N1, and if you can deduce that N prime equals N0 divided by N1, then you are also allowed to deduce that div of E0, E1 evaluates down to N prime. That's what this rule div is saying. I'm just telling you right now how to read it. When I give you the semantics, I would write these rules down, for example, on the exam. Now for not, we're actually going to have two rules. So one rule says, under the circumstance that E evaluates to zero, then we are allowed to deduce that not E evaluates down to one. Then under the circumstance that E evaluates down to N, and N is not equal to zero, then we're allowed to deduce that not E evaluates down to zero. All right, so this first rule is only going to fire when E evaluates down to zero, the second rule is only going to fire when E evaluates down to some number that's not zero. All right, so here is the sum total of our natural deduction style rules for if or if. So we have rules that specify what to do for constants, for plus, for div, for not, and for if. And here's the observation I want to make. These rules in natural deduction have a near identical sort of correspondence immediately with the pattern matching that we wrote in the previous lecture for our metacircular interpreter. These rules will all correspond to different cases of the match statement that we wrote in our interpreter. So let's start pulling some of them out. All right, so now we've defined for you these rules for if or if. So You'll want to be looking back at these and you might even want to write them down on a sheet of paper right now so you can take some notes of them. I often found that when I was learning this material, writing it out for myself was hugely helpful. So we've got these rules. How do we actually use them? How do we use them to actually tell us some information? What am I going to ask you to do with them on the exam to show that you know how these rules work? Well. What we could do is formally prove now, using these rules, that some program evaluates to some result. And so I can use these rules to actually show you why a certain program computes a certain answer, which is the first step to understanding formally what our program does. We actually have to be able to give mathematical proofs of why programs operate the way they do. That's the big benefit for what natural deduction enables when it comes to specifying programming language semantics. So let's look at this example program right here. I've got if 
plus one negative one. And I say, if that is not equal to zero, then I return three, otherwise I return four. Now I told you in the last lecture informally that this program just should evaluate to four. And we wrote our own little interpreter to show that it evaluated and we had defined it showing an evaluation for four, right? If you run this through the interpreter that we built last lecture, and remember of course it's racket data, so make sure you put a quote in front of it if you do. But uh, how can I use our natural deduction style rules to prove that this is the case? Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start the, with the thing that I wanna prove below the arrow. And then I have to choose one of the rules to apply. So if I go back and I look at all the different rules that might apply, I might ask myself, how could I get something on top of the turnstile, or sorry, on top of the, uh, on top of the bar? How could I get something on top of the bar right here? Well, I could use the if rule. To perform natural deduction, I need something called a uh, unification. All right, so what I need to do is I need to choose an E0, an E1, and an E2, and also an N and N prime to fill in all of these holes and apply this rule. All right, so let's see, which of these could possibly apply? Well, we're going to want to choose if false. The reason we're gonna to wanna to choose if false is because this branch right here for the guard actually does evaluate to zero, which means we're going to end up taking the false branch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply this rule where the E zero right here is going to line up with plus one, negative one. And so I'm going to replace that in the rule. E zero here gets replaced with plus one, negative one. So I'll put that in the E zero spot. And then I'm going to have the uh, right-hand side evaluates to zero, or sorry, sorry the, the plus one, negative one, that all evaluates to zero. And then E2 here is going to be uh, four, and so we're going to have four over here. This evaluates to four. But we're not done quite yet, because if we look at actually how these rules are, uh, are specified, plus, to be able to prove plus, I actually have to show all of the stuff on top of the uh, bar for this rule right here. And for const, if I wanna show that some constant evaluates to itself, I have to actually prove that that constant is in the set of integers. I couldn't, for example, evaluate the string hello to itself. These rules would not simply not allow me to do that. None of them help me to show me how I could evaluate a string. And so I'm going to perform this unification here where E0 is gonna be plus of one, negative one, E1 is just three, E2 is four, and N prime is four. All right, now when I do that, then I need to keep making progress. I can prove this fact four evaluates to itself just by using this const rule right here. Oops, by using this const rule right here. All right. So the const rule tells me I can say something evaluates to itself whenever that something is in integer. And in this case, now this is sort of an axiom. I'm just sort of relying, this is sort of the end of the proof. I just sort of take for granted, four is just an integer. All right, so then how do I continue with the plus? Well, there's this rule over here that says I can apply if I have E0, that evaluates to N0, and I have E1, that evaluates to N1, and I have N prime equals N0 plus N1, well then I am allowed to say that plus of E0, E1 evaluates to N prime. So I have to figure out, well what's E0 going to be? Well that's going to be one. That's just gonna evaluate to itself. What's E1 going to be? Well that's gonna be negative one. That just evaluates to itself. And then in, z in prime is going to be in zero, which is one plus in one, which is negative one. So in prime is all going to just be zero. And this whole thing is going to be zero. So we can't have any variables when we substitute. That's our rule, remember. Rule says there can be no variables in the resulting unification. So what we're going to do is when we apply this, we're gonna substitute in, we're actually gonna get these three branches up here. So we're now we need to prove these three things. Well. These two look just like this proof we had to do over here. All right, so for this one, we're just gonna say one evaluates to one. We're not done yet, we have to write something over here because of our const rule. Our const rule tells us to decide that something evaluates to itself 
first I have to prove that something is an integer. All right? And then we're going to do the same thing over here. Negative 1 is also an integer. And then this last observation right here, 1 plus 1 is equal to 0, we can just assume that. I'm going to tell you in this class, you can always assume basic rules about algebra. So if you were to write this formally down in a proof in mathematics, you would say follows by the rules of algebra, for example. There's, there's enough ceremony there. We don't need to uh, show you a proof of that, for example. We're going to assume you can use that. So this entire thing taken together, this whole tree, which we got by applying these different rules, this whole thing is a proof that this program computes for, derived via the natural deduction rules. All right, so here's my question to you. What if you tried to prove that this program actually evaluated the three? What if you tried to write a proof that was kind of broken, that proved the wrong thing, which is kind of not what we want? Could you use these rules to do it? Well, it turns out that you can't. If you look, there are only two possible rules that you could apply to if. None of these other rules could possibly apply. They can only help you build a not, a div, a plus, or a constant. But if you've got an if, you really have to use one of these two rules. It's the only possible option you have. And so one of them has to apply. However, if t will only let you evaluate the true branch when in the guard evaluates to something that's not equal to zero. In this case, you will only ever be able to prove that the guard evaluates to zero. You can't prove that this guard ever evaluates to anything else. And so that's an example of how this proof system simply won't let you write proofs for things that don't evaluate to the correct result. Now, as practice for this lecture, I'd like you to work on trying to use these same rules that we just had as before to try to write out proofs for the following two things. See, what would plus 0, 1 of 2 evaluate to? Well, let's try to modify that. That's all going to evaluate to just 3, right? So that's one exercise you should work on. What about this next one? If 1 div one by one, otherwise two. So this should just result in one, right? So this will result in, just result in one. So then try to work on proving both of these things using the rules that we had over here. Let me copy and paste them over so you can just hover on this slide. So we're gonna do proofs, these two things, using these rules for our language right here. And this language, remember, this is if arith, but using natural deduction right here. So in the same style that we did in the last few slides, see if you can figure out how to write these proofs using these structures right here. That's basically what's gonna be on the participation quiz for this week. So once you feel like you can do it, please feel free, and then we'll discuss it in class.